In all of history, some people have stood out in front of the rest. Culture has always looked up to this person, calling him or her a hero. The ancient Greeks had Hercules, Achilles, Odysseus, men who were valiant in battle and courageous in the face of death. Fairy tales account for brave men willing to slay dragons to rescue the damsel and restore peace to a broken land. Now, comic books depict these figures as vigilantes dressed in masks and capes, saving their city from the terror of an evil villain. Movies and television show us time and time again what a hero looks like. Some of them have capes and others have metal suits named Jarvis. We have always loved the hero, but what does this character look like in the real world? What if we define the hero as selfless, and instead of lusting for selfish gain, they desire good? That he sacrifices his own needs for the needs of others around him? What if they are someone who inspires us? Someone who takes hold of our hearts and beckons us to live better? To be a light to us when all other lights have been extinguished? To be the hope we need when it seems like all courage has been broken. To be utterly destroyed and beaten, all for the sake of the weak and the oppressed. What if the hero is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles? Good morning. Um, if you have a copy of your Bible with you, if you open them up to 1 Kings, which is in the front part of the Bible, I think it's like the sixth or seventh book in. I don't know. I didn't memorize that. Maybe eighth. Somewhere in there. Don't, don't judge me on that. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 is where we're going to be. And the story that we're going to look at today uh, has had a, a deep impact on me. And I can remember the first time I stumbled across this story, uh, I, was, uh, I was a teenager, and I had kind of set up that I, I wanted to read through the Bible, that I was like going to go in order, Genesis to Revelation, I was going to read through the whole Bible. And I remember, like, if you've ever tried that, um, it usually goes okay until you get to Leviticus, and then it just comes crashing and burning down, because Leviticus is a... It's a terrible, terrible book. <laughs> um, it's just like, gah. And then you go to numbers, which is lots of numbers, and I'm not necessarily a math guy. So that was like, I was just kind of like trodden through it. And then all of a sudden, I, I got to the story in First Kings, and I felt like I had stepped into like a heavyweight boxing match. Like all of a sudden there was like this dramatic turn and I like, I literally felt like I just like moved out of just like record, 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 uh, historical data, more numbers to all of a sudden this like incredible event that like really like, I mean, it, it felt like like our biggest sporting events today in terms of like the significance and the tension and the crowd and everything that was happening there. And I, I knew at the time, I, I knew at the time that this story was incredibly important, but I didn't know exactly what to do with it. Like, I didn't know why it was so important, why it had such significant meaning. And it was kind of like, um, I don't know how many of you have seen this, and uh, make sure you're age appropriate if you're a kid here, uh, or for parents uh, to see. Uh, the first time I watched Schindler's List, um, which is actually also the only time I've watched Schindler's List because it's really hard to get up to watch that movie. Like, hey, anybody want to watch Schindler's List? Like, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, it's the story of a man um, who basically posed as a Nazi sympathizer um, in order to save Jewish people during the Holocaust. And that's a very like short telling of that story. Um, but throughout this story, uh, you see an incredible display of courage, but you also see the horrors of the world and the great sacrifice it takes to have courage amidst the horrors of the world. And I remember watching it, uh, I watched it in high school the first time, and like the movie like finished and the credits started rolling, and you like, I just didn't know what to do with myself, because <laughs> we watched it in a class and the class was done, it was like, do I get up and go? Like, do I stay here and cry? <laughs> like, I feel like, I feel like it's wrong to just go to my next class and just move on with my life. Like, I feel like I need to do something now in this moment, but I don't know exactly what that is because I just know what I've witnessed and what I've experienced here is so incredibly important. 
And, and I felt that way. Uh, one, one of my favorite books is this book, How Now Shall We Live by Charles Colson. And if you're unfamiliar with who um, Chuck Colson is, uh, he was basically, he was Richard Nixon, the president. He was like his ax man. He was the guy who went out and did the dirty dirt work. And he's the one who was actually implicated in all the Watergate scandal stuff. And when he goes to prison for Watergate and numerous other things, uh, he finds Christ and his life is radically transformed and he does this incredible amount of work. Actually, there was a, there was a task force that was sent out recently uh, to make recommendations of what to do about the incredibly high incarceration rate that our country has. And they named their resolutions, their proposals, in the name of Chuck Colson, because they said no one has done more to, to change, to reform incarceration than Chuck Colson has. And in this book that he wrote, he, he writes about how the incredible impact that Christ has on our lives and how it should permeate into everything else we do in our entire lives. And how when you are changed spiritually, it should have a dramatic effect on the world that we live in. And he like goes through this whole thing, like, okay, in light of Christ, what Christ has done, and his last question is like, how now shall we live? And I remember reading that book, and it was like the same thing. It was like, I feel like I need to do something, and I feel like something has to be different because what I've experienced right here is more, is more significant than just the everyday mundane stuff. I feel like I have like entered into a moment that was sacred, and it feels odd to step back into the practical side of the world. I feel like I just want to sit here. And that's what this story that we're going to look at today, um, that's what it's meant to me. And a little bit of background, uh, the story takes place uh, on Mount Carmel, and that's a picture of what Mount Carmel looks like today. And here's, here's the setup for the story, is the nation of Israel, God's people, kind of the people he set apart as his special people, who he revealed himself to, who he loved, who he blessed, who he cared for after all these years, um, they have gone awry, <laughs> And what's happened is there were these 12 tribes that were meant to make up this one nation, and those tribes have split. And now they've become two separate nations. And it's not just that they've split, it's they've begun turning to other gods, which seems strange in our culture, but I think as we go through the story, it may not seem so strange compared to how we live today. And so what happens is they've created other gods, they've named other gods, and they've turned from the life that God has called them to live. And there's kind of this one lone voice in the country of a guy by the name of Elijah who stood as God's prophet. And he continuously comes out, and he's got the ministry of encouragement, and then he comes out and he condemns the people for how they're living. He said, you're doing this, that's not what you're called to do. You're doing this, that's not what you were called to be. And so it kind of has this thing where, where Elijah has kind of set himself up as the enemy of the king. And the, he's like number one on the FBI's most wanted list because the king just wants rid of Elijah because Elijah keeps calling him out for the things that he's doing wrong. And one of the biggest things that the king was doing wrong is they had created this god by the name of Baal. And, and they have turned the nation, instead of worshiping the God who created them, they worship Baal, uh, for obvious reasons, because Baal doesn't tell them what they're doing is wrong, <laughs> which makes it very nice. That's why there's always a temptation to set up our own gods, because the gods we set up want us to live exactly how we're living, which is extremely convenient for us. And so it kind of culminates in this moment that they've had this back and forth and this tension that has gone on for quite some time. And then all of a sudden, in this moment, Elijah sets out a challenge, and he sends word to the king, and it's, meet me on Mount Carmel and bring all the prophets of Baal. And so there's kind of like a stirring in this country as word gets out, because Elijah would like appear one place, and then it'd be gone, and appear another place, and no one ever knew where he was. And then all of a sudden, word got out to everybody that Elijah's going to be on Mount Carmel, and he's asking for a showdown with the prophets of Baal. And so they kind of meet up on this mountain, and Elijah's kind of on the one side, and the prophets of Baal are on the other side, and we see there's like 450 of them. And so it's kind of like this like epic start. But then we see that there's a third group. And I want to point out the third group to you. This is 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. It says this, it says, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. And, and so we see, this is really important, that this showdown is not just about Elijah, and it's not really about the prophets of Baal. It's about all these bystanders. 
That we've got Elijah kind of off to one side. We've got all the prophets of Baal off on these other side. But there's a large crowd that has gathered that is just looking on, wondering what's going to happen. And we don't know if they had spiritual motivations. We don't know if they had moral convictions. They could have just been there for the show. They could have just been curious as to what's going to take place. And so they kind of all gather and they step out before and they're waiting to see what happens next. And so Elijah addresses him. He goes, what's going to happen is about those who waver between two opinions. It's about those who may say one thing and do another. It's about those who may claim one life. Their convictions are in one camp but their lifestyle is in another. And then he sets up what's going to take place. And this is incredible. Verse 22. It says, Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Now, now this is intriguing, is, um, is this God that they had created, Baal, um, he, he was depicted in the image of a bull. That, that's how they saw Baal. When they would create idols, they would create something that had the head of a bull. And Baal was considered to be the God of fire. That's what he had control over. And so Elijah's got this like incredible setting on the scene that he's basically, he's just giving them home court advantage. He's like, all right, we're going to have a showdown between the Lord of Israel and Baal. And so we're going to get bulls. And all the prophets are like, oh yeah, this is good, Baal's there. And we're going to see who answers by fire. And like, if it would have been like ice, they probably would have objected. They go, no, no, we're going to see who answers by fire. So if you've got to think like, He's like going, all right, we're going to play. It's going to be me, one, verse 450. We're going to play on your home court, and I'm going to spot you 49 points, and we're going to play to 50. And they're like, okay, we, we got this. And so he kind of gives them this massive advantage. But I think it's significant that he specifies, and it's not just because the god Baal was in control of fire, but it is significant that he signifies that it is fire that they're going to look for. Fire in their culture meant very similar things to our culture. Fire meant power. Fire meant power that could not be fully controlled. It could not be fully tamed. Fire meant passion. Fire meant a life that was alive. And so he kind of has this epic setting. And he said, I'm going to have an altar. And you're going to have an altar. And we're going to get the bull out, and we're going to stop and wait and see which God answers by fire. And then this happens. Verse 25. It says, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. If I was more extroverted, I'd do that, but that's not going to happen. Okay. It says, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. This is, this is maybe my favorite passage in all of Scripture because this is the first evidence we have of biblical trash talking. Like, this is awesome. We, like, I think we over-sanctify, we over-spiritualize people in Scripture, and we assume, like, oh, he's just peaceful, he's just calm, he's quiet. Like, this is awesome. This is a guy who's a little bit arrogant in what he's doing. So it says this, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought, or busy, or traveling. 
Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. Um, In another translation that I believe is actually more accurate, one of the statements that he uses is, perhaps he's out back relieving himself. (laughs) You just just need to give it a minute because maybe your God, I don't know, it's taking a while. Maybe he's going number two. Maybe that's what the holdup is all about. Like, just, just give him a second. And he continues. It says, so they shouted louder and slash themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom until their blood flowed. Now, doesn't that seem crazy? The idea that people would parade around a God that they created and hurt themselves for that false God. Maybe it's not so crazy. It says, midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. Uh, now, this is important. And so, and so they get around their altar that they've created, and they dance, and they cut themselves, and they let themselves bleed on the bull, hoping that it would invoke something of their God. And Elijah is just kind of like sitting off in the distance. I think we can tell from time that about three hours pass when he starts taunting them. I think Elijah was getting bored. Like, I think he thought they were going to be done before this. He's like, are, are you serious? We're still going? Like, maybe if I just make fun of them enough, they'll give up or they'll wear themselves out. And then after they give up on this and like the yelling and the dancing has kind of died, died down, he just goes, come here to me. And, and he does something significant. He takes 12 stones and he sets them up on the altar. Now, this means little to us, but it would have been a slap in the face for the people. Because these 12 stones would have been an obvious symbol of the life they were supposed to live. And so he kind of pauses in this moment and goes, remember this? Remember what you were called to? That maybe in a moment years ago you saw so clearly? Remember, this is what you were supposed to be. This is where your life has turned. But this is what you were called to become. And then he continues. He says, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord And he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed. This is like 24 pounds of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Is he not awesome? (laughs) Like, all right, we're playing to 50. 450 of you versus one of me, I'm going to spot you 49 points, and if you would, go ahead and tie my hands and ankles together. Like, that's, that's what it should be. Four large jar, jars with water, and pour it on the offering in the wood. Verse 34, do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, which is who these stones would have been pointing back to, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. I want to pause right there because that phrase is so important and I want that to stick with you. He says, answer me, Lord, answer me. But but he doesn't say this. He doesn't go like, answer me 
because I'm going to be really embarrassed if this doesn't work out, which is kind of how I would have felt like, God, I've kind of showboated around a little bit. I got the water. I made fun of their God. I think they're going to kill me if this doesn't work out. I don't know. Elijah's got his heart in different places. He says, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Isn't that incredible? I remember the first time reading through that, and I felt like I had just stumbled into something that was way bigger than myself. It was like, oh my word. Like, I was like, the nerve of Elijah to parade around like that and do that. The, the craziness of the people to dance around for a God that they had created and to cut themselves upon it. And the way that God responds, that, that like resolute thing of like fire comes from God, but not just a little bit of fire. Like it burns up the sacrifice, the wood and the water and everything that's there. It is all consuming. I think, man, this is, this is amazing. There was, a, there was something I saw online uh, recently. It was a real advertising campaign. And I, I thought that it was so fascinating. Uh, they, took, uh, they took companies and they took, their, they took out their regular slogans and put in slogans of if they were really honest about what was happening, about who they were, what would this company's actual advertising slogan be? I, I thought these were absolutely incredible. Um, I, I want to show you a couple of them. Uh, the first one is this. Um, it's Sperry's. And the slogan is, you probably haven't even been on a boat. <laughs> I don't know how many of you own a pair of Sperry's. I do. I have never worn them on a boat. They're boat shoes, which means I wear them with khaki shorts. <laughs> uh, next one is Monopoly. Monopoly. And here's the slogan with it. A great way to ruin friendships. And you may, like, get pumped, like, you've got Boardwalk and Park Place all situated, and you've got the big hotels on there, and you're just pumped, and your friend lands on that, and no more friendship. It just goes away like that. Uh, I think this next one is the most accurate. WebMD, convince yourself that you have a terminal illness. <laughs> I have a headache. No, it's a brain tumor. <laughs> I have a cough. Uh, it could be a cold, or it's a brain tumor. <laughs> My, my elbow hurts. Uh, did you fall? No, brain tumor. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Uh, LinkedIn. This is the next one. Connect with people for no reason at all. I want to specify that. If you have tried to add me on LinkedIn, I joined that when I was a junior in high school and have never looked back since. So I apologize that I'm ignoring your request. Uh, Ikea. We throw in extra parts just to mess with you. <laughs> they do. <laughs> like, it's true. <laughs> and... Well, I always have extra parts when I put anything together. Like, oh, it's a gift, Bethany. <laughs> Go ahead and sit down. <laughs> and then the last one uh, is personally indicting to me because I do have this. It's uh, Apple computers, $2,000 Facebook machines. Oh, and I do have one more. This is fruit stripe gum. Tastes great for three seconds. I'd also add in Double Bubble does that as well. You put it in his life. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> that, was, that was good. <laughs> I should have just swallowed it. Uh, here, here's the fascinating thing about that to me, is, is they go through these, like, it's like, what would it be like if we actually saw these things for what they really were? I, I wonder what would happen if we had a real advertising campaign for us. What would it look like if it was actually just fully out there, not just our convictions, not just our beliefs, but do our lifestyles, does our conduct match what we say. Remember, this story is not about Elijah. It's not about the prophets of Baal. It's about those who waver. I, I think the group that wavers is fascinating. Because for them, if you ask them, do you believe in God? They would say, yes, absolutely. But then if you pushed further and went, okay, so what does your life look like? What does your conduct show? 
I understand you have convictions. I understand you have statements. But how does that actually flesh its way out into the rest of how you live? The definition of them is they are those who waver. Those who may claim this altar, but actually dance around this one. I had some friends um, who had a tiff in their relationship. It was, it was nothing big, honestly. To them, it was big at the moment, but it really, it was, it was nothing big. Um, but, it, but it sent a crack in their relationship, and then it felt like this heavy weight that each of them wore, and they could never get past it. And, and for all of us who were surrounding the situation, it was so easy, it was so obvious, it was so plain. Like, just forgive each other. <laughs> just move on. Like... Bury the hatchet, drop the chain, let it go, move past this. Uh, but for them, that, that just wasn't possible. And, and they claimed all these different things. They claim like, well, I, I, just, I just can't get hurt again. It's wise for me not to trust. Now, they, these are mature people. They know scripture. They know we forgive as Christ forgave us, who had no reason to forgive us, but did it anyway, and our lives are supposed to be a model of the same thing. Now, they claimed this altar, but they found themselves dancing around this one. I had a conversation with a lady who, um, whose marriage, it wasn't bad. It wasn't, it wasn't bad. Um... But that was kind of part of the problem. It's not that they fought, it's that there was no reason to fight. <laughs> there just wasn't much there. And before long, someone started paying attention to them. Someone of the opposite gender started just noticing them. And they liked it. And it wasn't anything big, it wasn't anything, like, inappropriate. But when they had been in a relationship that had felt dead for so long, all of a sudden when there was a new face and new excitement and new care, it, it was exhilarating. They hadn't crossed any lines. They hadn't crossed any lines, but instead they chose to linger. Now, now they knew scripture. They're, they're smart. Flee from sexual immorality. Not even a hint but for them, they rationalized that it had felt dead for so long that they deserved this. They needed this. And so they found themselves here. There was a guy who I've had frequent conversations with who, when he was younger, began late-night Internet activity that was far less than what he was called to be. Now, he told himself this. He told himself he was just immature at the time, and when he got to the next phase of life, then he would give it up. Once he had a serious girlfriend, he would stop. Once he got married, he would stop. Once he had kids, he would stop. And he kept delaying obedience further and further until he got to the point in time in his relationship where, where the chemistry between him and his spouse, the passion between him and his spouse wasn't there. He didn't see the direct link to what he was doing late nights by himself at all because that would be too obvious. But he began telling himself, I'm not getting it anywhere else. I have to get it somewhere. And so I deserve this. I'm owed this. Not a dumb guy. Not even what I would describe as an immature guy. But he kept dancing around this altar, waiting for passion to come. But no one answered. No one said anything. There was a student who had big hopes for their life and what they would accomplish, degrees that they would have, things that they would go on to do. And their life just kept getting busier and busier. Some of it was work at church. Some of it was having an actual job, sports, other extracurriculars. And so studies had really kind of put themselves on the back burner. 
and they found themselves in positions where they didn't have time to do what they previously had time to do. And it all culminated at this spot with one individual test. If they got a bad grade on this test, it would hurt their GPA, which would hurt the further things they would do in their life, and all the good that they could accomplish. And so they told themselves that it was the morally right thing to do for the better good of themselves and the world to cheat. It, wasn't, it, was, it was a test. It was an individual test, right? It was one test. But they had convinced themselves that the most God-honoring thing that they could do for the betterment of the world was to give a false testimony as to who they really were. And you know how it goes. Uh, that one thing led to a second thing. Individual moments of disobedience quickly become patterns of disobedience. And, and they would claim this. I mean, they knew what this altar was all about. But they begin to see their lives revolving around this other one. There was a lady I know who was the kind of person, they were, they were just kind of friends with everybody. And as a result of that, everybody would just come to them and they would tell them what was going on. And those moments quickly turned from counseling to gossip. The hard thing was is they enjoyed it. They enjoyed people coming to them with their problems. And while they knew inherently what they were doing was not healthy, for themselves, for their own soul, or for the souls of the person who were telling them all these things constantly. They convinced themselves. They need someone to talk to. They need someone to vent to. Uh, scripture's pretty clear on the idea of venting, of trashing others to those around us. We have a God who we go to. That, that's not meant to be for all those around us. You can sanctify any activity and say that this is spiritual and that this is right. And they knew better. They knew what they were doing was turning from good. I don't know about you, but I, but I hear these stories and, and I read this story. And I've got to quickly identify myself. I'm not Elijah in this story. I'm not the guy who stands up in front of the group of people and tells them, you've turned. You used to worship at this altar. And now you dance around gods that you've created, waiting for the answer to come. I'm not Elijah. I'm in the group that wavers. I, I'm not in the prophets of Baal. You're not either. You're not, I'm not leading the charge on that. But so often... My convictions are nowhere near my behavior. My beliefs do not match my lifestyle. And, and, I, and I hear the story, and I hear these stories over and over again, and it makes me feel guilt. It makes me feel shame at the life that I'm living. And I don't know about you, but we go through all this and we think, man, what a, what a crazy message for Valentine's Day, right? Like, who's feeling all warm and romantic inside? But here's the thing, is that if you're feeling guilt at this, you have missed what the story is about. Because he says so clearly right in the middle, this is Elijah's prayer. He says, answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. The goal of God in this moment was not for all the bystanders to go there and go, oh man, I've really messed up. You're right, we've, we've cut ourselves. We've sacrificed ourselves to this other God that we've created when we knew this was right. That, that's not the point. The point is in the moment that they would see how great their God loved them. You see, as a culture, as we celebrate Valentine's Day, we get infatuated with the idea of the grand romantic gesture, the the proposal that happens at a large public event, 
Roses giving in front of everyone to see so that everyone will know how much this one person loves this other person. And we make movies about it and we tell stories about it. And I assume wives quietly wish at home that their husbands would do more of it. And so we just get infatuated with this idea of the grand romantic gesture. And in this moment, when God's people have turned so far from him, he leads them up on top of a mountain. And he sends fire from the sky, not so that they would feel bad, but so that they would know so clearly that passion, that purpose, that power in your life only comes from one altar. And you can dance around the other altar for as long as you like. You can cut yourself. You can sacrifice and hurt yourself upon it, but there will be no answer. And so the people respond like anyone does who is smitten in love. They make a declaration of their own love. Now, now do we think in the moment that when the people declare their own love back for God when fire falls, that they assume they were always going to get it right? If they did, they're naive. Like, they knew their history. And we have record of how they continued to get it wrong after that. Like, we have factual document of the ways they continued to turn. And so I think in the moment they knew, like, even though they had seen fire come from sky, they had seen other things. They had the Red Sea be parted. They'd seen bread fall from heaven. This was just the next in another line of these grand romantic gestures that God gives them. But in a given moment they still see clearly the people that they were meant to become. They still see clearly who they were meant to be and where passion, purpose, and power comes from. And they declare so clearly, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I don't know about you, I don't know which altar you find your life at in this moment. But I know this about myself. Is that I have always claimed to be here. But I far too often find my life here. And I don't claim that I'll always get this right. I don't even expect that I'll always get this right. But I will say this, that in moments of clarity, in moments when I can see what I have become and how I have turned, that I will not delay my obedience for a second, but I will immediately return to the God who gives fire. I don't know where you are, but that's a decision you have to make. Let me pray for us. Father, when I read stories of your power, when I hear moments and experiences of your love made manifest in the world that I live in, I am amazed, I am overwhelmed. But Lord, I ask that all of that for me and for us and for all those who are here this morning does not drive our heads down into despair at our lack of conviction or our lack of obedience or our lack of willpower. That we would understand clearly in a moment that we do not come to you because we have gotten it right. But the signs of our sin and our brokenness are even more evidence of our desperation for you that we would understand that the reason why we come to you is because you are the only one who truly wants what is best for us. That you love with a love that is not self-seeking. That you extend mercy and grace and compassion in a way that is not self-serving. But you have always desired what is best for us, which can be seen so clearly in the sense that you have always desired us. And so turn our hearts to you.